great start to uh, our conversations. I'm going to ask two or three questions just to kick us off, but I hope that you're all thinking of uh, questions uh, yourselves. So <coughs> let me start with a question which, which, which touches on what both of you said, which is this question of um, bringing the past into the present and the future. Um, it, it often feels as though talking about the past, talking about heritage, is in some ways kind of freighted with a particular kind of political agenda or a kind of sense of resentment about the present, the way things are, are changing. I was speaking to someone the other day who had been doing social research and found that people very often started their comments about their area with the phrase, things have changed a lot around here, which is kind of code for my community is not the community that it was. So how, is there a way, as it were, of, uh, of relating to this kind of question of the past and heritage and its relevance today, which doesn't feel like a kind of almost predictable debate between a kind of traditionalist and a politically correct view? Is there a way in which we can kind of move out of that? Or, or, or are we always going to have a kind of contest of different kind of ways of thinking um, about the past and bringing it into today? And should we perhaps welcome the, politi the, the political nature of that debate? Jenny, you first. Um, well, I think it's terribly dangerous to generalize. I, that is my first, sorry. I, I'm a sociologist, that's all I do. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do I do think it's very d dangerous to generalize and there's no doubt about it that there are uh, areas where people might say, you know, this place is no longer what I remember it for, but there are equally places where you go where they are absolutely celebrating the fact that what has created that community has been that multiplicity of communities. Um, I, uh, I'm the daughter of a, a, a refugee uh, who was here in the 30s, and my parents worked in the east end of London. And that in what was a very Jewish area, and then they had a bookshop that was then sold to um, a Bangladeshi community because, and it became a, a Bangladeshi dress shop. And, uh, and then it was knocked down and it, it's now a rather trendy place in, in, in the city. But that, the way that community has changed, when you talk to people, there is an awareness of, of the fact that that community has changed. I, I think that it is really important that um, people's different stories are recognized. And um, I've just come back from uh, Alaska, which I had gone to under the impression that it was Sarah Palin's Alaska. And I had, I'm really fascinated by what Gillian was saying because I walk, came into this city called Sitka and discovered there was a Russian Orthodox church um, uh, that the Russian heritage, even though it stopped in 1867, actually didn't stop in 1867 because they converted the native tribe, the Tinglet, to Russian Orthodoxy, but they embraced part of their own Tinglet culture in that form of Russian Orthodoxy. So wherever you went in that place, it was both American and Russian, and it was living in an extraordinary way with a great pride in the fact that it was that melting pot of so many different things. And I think you would find that across the United Kingdom. And I think those, those quotes um, from Bradford, the people in Bradford, um, were quite important um, in terms of, of how a community has, uh, it, it, that it struggles. Um, and uh, that quote from Gillian saying that it could be a force for good or ill I think there's no doubt about it, heritage we know, we've seen, can be a force for good or ill. It's happening all over the world in that sense. But that when it's good, it can actually bring a kind of cohesion. And Julian, I mean, you're not a political journalist, but you, I'm sure, <laughs> observe, fascinated by the debates we've had recently around the origins of the First World War, around British values, around what should be taught in the history curriculum. Do you think we are consigned to a continuous kind of debate between traditionalism and a kind of more diverse, more open, more contested model? Can we ever transcend that? Um, well, I have two points to make. Um, the first is that something I feel very strongly about is that everybody needs to move well beyond the idea of the nation state and narrowly define nationalism. The nation state was something that was really in invented and developed in the 18th and 19th century in Western Europe. And it worked for a short period in Western Europe. 
It sort of has worked in the United States, but over much of the world today, including Europe, the concept of nation state and nationalism, the idea that the ethnic unit has to be, go hand in hand with the unit of governance, I think is it looking increasingly outworn. And part of my um, reference to the idea of people having multiplicity of identities and celebrating the hierarchy of identities that people have and recognizing that identities are porous and boundaries can be malleable is a way of saying, well, actually, yes, heritage is about celebrating symbols from the past and identity. When it becomes exclusively centered on nationalism and national symbols, it can become potentially quite divisive. But it doesn't have to be focused on just a nation state. And one of the wonderful things that came out of that video earlier was people saying, yes, we celebrate our sense of place in Derby, Bradford, in regional areas. Doesn't mean we're not English anymore. Doesn't mean we're not British anymore. But it's a way of talking about the rich, multi-dimensional nature of identity, history, and also forward-looking um, cohesion going forward. And I think it's very interesting that you said, Jenny, because it takes one to the second point I wanted to ask, really, which is that a few years ago, there was a kind of sense that place was ever less important in the face of the mobility of people, of information, of capital. But in a sense, there's been a kind of rediscovery of place, which one might associate with a growing emphasis on cities, the different trajectories of cities. Uh, even in our very centralized country uh, of, of England, uh, uh, all parties now wanting to kind of get on the bandwagon of saying that they recognize the need to decentralize to urban level for economic reasons. Do you sense a kind of rediscovery uh, of, of place? And, and what significance does that have for heritage? Well, I'm somebody who thinks that the technological revolution, the internet, has changed the way that we interact in many, many levels. And at least three things that are worth thinking about in relation to the heritage debate are, firstly, that it enables communities to form that are not defined by place, but by all kinds of other ties in an extraordinary way. Families can suddenly create links with each other right across the globe. Communities um, of different you know, ethnic origin can suddenly reconnect and celebrate their identity over the internet in a way that would have been completely unimaginable before. So frankly, that's fantastic. Um, secondly, it allows people to get access to extraordinary amounts of information and to actually research, celebrate, and essentially define their past and their sense of you know, rootedness much more clearly, much more effectively than ever before. But thirdly, I happen to think that precisely because the cyber world is becoming so perver pervasive in our lives, people are actually, oddly enough, valuing real face-to-face -face interactions as well. And that's something that, frankly, the heritage um, movement can build on very much because the experience of going to a, a place, be that a stately castle, be it a, a you know, humdrum, regular old you know, historical site, the idea of actually gathering together and having festivals and celebrations is very, very powerful. And I mean, just a couple of quick thoughts about that. If you look at the idea of incorporating the past into the present, you know, take a stately home. A stately home can just be a stately home. It can just sit there as an inert object. It can be the setting of a series, a piece of creativity in the media world, which actually has the ability to go viral or transformational. I mean, Downton Abbey, for example, has to have been an extraordinary hit number in America over the last few months that has managed to create an, or take an element of British history and culture and popularize it in a way that, again, would have been unimaginable before. Or a stately home can be the setting of an incredibly dynamic cultural festival. I don't know how many of you have been to the festival Port Elliot down in Cornwall, but it's one of my favorites, where you take a piece of the past and overlay it with incredible cultural collisions from the present and really have a sense of dynamic, forward-looking culture that's very exciting. But, I, but I, uh, I mean, I go back to your question, Matthew, and, and the importance of, as, has place become more important in some ways? Um, I do think that over the last 10, 12 years, starting actually when Glasgow became the city of culture um, and, and the regeneration of Glasgow and, and that sense of pride that, that there, there, there was in Glasgow and that it, that it was showcased to the world, then Liverpool, look at what the Manchester Arts, Arts Festival has done in terms of Manchester. And there are examples all over the country where uh, pride in place has become very, very important. And it's, 
it's not just that people have gone global and that there are other communities that you can create. I think people are very conscious about of the places they live in and they want them to be better and they want to feel pride in them and they want to showcase them and they want other people to understand why they matter to them. And I think that is a kind of... It, it's grown in this country in, and in a way that there was a time when people were sometimes ashamed of their places. And I think that that is going in that way. I think that's very, very important. And I think Heritage has played a critical role in that rethinking of what people feel about the place they live in. And that's presumably something which varies from institution to institution. I, the last two heritage sites I visited with the British Museum, which feels like a kind of global phenomenon. I mean, the fact that it's based in a particular part of central London isn't particularly relevant to it. What's relevant to it is, is the fact that it's full of people from all over the world. It's full of artifacts, of course, from all over the world. And I went to Derby Silk Mill on Saturday for an RSA conference, and, and that's full of Derbyness. It's all about the specificity of Derby's particular history and a kind of project which they feel they're involved in of, of kind of reviving people's idea of Derby, and they link it very much to what's going on currently in Derby. So presumably when you look at funding applications, what, th this question of how people relate to place um, and how important they see their location as a facility is, a, is an interesting variable. Well, I, 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 if, if, we, if we're talking about how HLF approaches making those kind of decisions, one of the critical things for us is evidence that it matters to local people and that they're involved and that they have been involved and consulted and that this isn't something that's going to be imposed on them. And I think increasingly people want to take control of their own heritage and their own environments. And I think that will be an increasing tension as well. Tension? Because, uh, because when decisions, there will be decisions that get taken centrally by central government that will be in conflict with what people want to do locally and that will will therefore have increasing tension. And by that, I'm not be meaning the kind of not in my backyard, but what people might want to do with a building um, might not be what a developer wants to do with a building or something like that. And, and that those kind of tensions are going to be an interesting set of challenges for heritage in the future. Which brings me neatly onto my final question, just for you, Jane, might be slightly trite, but... Uh, if you had to choose one challenge above all others, which you think you'll be passing on to your successor in terms of HLF's future, what would, what would that one biggest challenge or opportunity be? Well, I think the biggest challenge, and it's a challenge for all of us in, in, in Heritage, is, is, is finding new sustainable business models. Mm. Um, and there are, there are people in this room who've been doing just that, but there are others who have found it very difficult um, and there are places that are really loved where in reality a sustainable business model is not going to be found. I think that's a big challenge for, for um, the heritage industry. But that's interesting from an anthropological perspective, isn't it? Because moving from a culture which is a public sector, third sector culture into a culture which is more a commercial, a culture in which you have investors, that's, uh, that, that is a culture shock for many people, these are different milieu. Completely, and I think one of the most interesting things that um, Jenny said in, in the speech earlier was about the way that silos are breaking down and that you know culture can no longer afford to be simply treated as something which is a separate self-contained box, um, for better and for worse. In some ways, it's not so different from what's happening inside many companies today where there used to be a box sitting inside companies called corporate and social responsibility, the kind of do-gooding box that companies would keep separate from the rest of the operations. But increasingly within the financial markets and the corporate world, there's a recognition that that is breaking down, bl down and blurring. I'd just say one thing though, which is um, perhaps a note for um, optimism or potentially for exciting opportunities that could be exploited. I just came back from the Aspen Ideas Festival over in Colorado, which is where a lot of um, philanthropists and business leaders and economists and cultural leaders meet um, once a year in America. And one of the banks has done a big survey of wealthy individuals in America and discovered that amongst the younger generation, there's been an explosive increase in the level of interest 
in funding projects that have a social impact. And I do think that part of this shift in perceptions and shift in attitudes after the great financial crisis is that you do have increasingly a recognition that investing can be done for social good and that actually there are people who want to use their money in ways that can actually benefit us all and promote, promote social cohesion. And in many ways, if the heritage sector can tap into that going forward, that's potentially a very exciting opportunity. Fantastic.